Okay, <clears throat> so I have, um, I wrote this up. This, this is a copy off the email that I sent in answering the question. And um, um, so I'll just go over it and, and I've got scriptures included in it here. I started off saying the first resurrection is those who obtain, let me, let me first just explain it without reading it. The first resurrection is when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you continue in that Holy Ghost birth until you overcome and uh, finish your course. And those that are that finish their first resurrection uh, will be in the man-child rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. So I have here the first resurrection, those who first obtain everlasting life by receiving the Holy Ghost, which is a new birth of the nature of God. And the Father, uh, nature of God, the Father, given through and by His Son, Jesus Christ. Though these are those who lived during the day of the Lord and in the harvest period of the early church, day of Pentecost, AD 70, and continued in faith unto perfection, the fullness of Christ, the Lamb's book of life. Um, uh, okay, here and 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 well, it's it's wrote out here too. But in Saint John five twenty four, Jesus said, "Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life." That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You've got you've been born of a, a, of the everlasting nature of Christ or everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. Um, how did Paul say that in Romans 8, that now there is therefore no condemnation in them that walk after the spirit. Uh, I mean, they walk not after the flesh, but after the uh, spirit that is in Christ, Jesus. So this is that continual uh, resurrection birth or baptism of the Holy Ghost, um, but is passed from death unto life. Then he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. That hour is coming and now is, that was that prophetical hour they were in. It didn't take place right then when he was talking, but it took place on the day of Pentecost in that prophetical hour. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. This was during the early church harvest. The same will be true to all those in the restored, restored church in the harvest in the end of the Gentile world, where the remainder of the overcomers will be made up. Those two groups will make up the man-child that will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. I can, by the way, copy these notes <clears throat> and post them on our group WhatsApp page. And that way you can, you know, have the, then if y'all want to copy them and put them wherever. If you have a Olive Tree Bible app like I have here, then you could simply um, you can go to like here's my notes um, and you can you can just go down here where there's notes you can add right here you can add a category which the way I do that is I just add a note to it so if you add that, you just type in and, and you'll get you'll get a list of your categories. See my categories up here. So down here is resurrections of the just and resurrections. Okay. 
So here's the notes that we're in. So you could make that and put these notes right in there. And then you can, you could, um, like this verse right here, you could, you could go to this verse and make a note. I'll just show you. Add a note. Okay. And the title of it could be Resurrections. And then you could <clears throat> go down here where your annotations are and change the category. Change the category to Resurrections. So there it is now. And so if you wanted to go to, uh, let's see here. C note on resurrection, let's see if that'll work. Yeah, then what you do is you go down here to resurrections and open your note. So you can make notes. I, I do all kinds of things with this Bible program. I'll show you, for example. Uh, I just made a I just make a category. When I'm at a meeting, I'm using my iPad now instead of a note note. So if you go down here where I made I made a, a note of ministers meetings. And here's uh, the ministers campground ministers meeting. Okay. So I, and there's my notes that I took when I was there and they're right in here. And I have, I have, I have meeting thoughts, 31 meeting notes. There's on all the different meetings I've been to recently. So <clears throat> you can keep all kinds of Bible notes and meetings in this program. You can relate them to any scripture. You can make a note on any scripture. You can copy, uh, for example, you can copy the Strong's on a, on a word. You know, if you wanted to take this word, this definition here of, of our, and you wanted to take that, and however much of it you wanted, let me maybe go up here. Let's just say that I want to take this much of it, copy it. Okay. And then where that hour is, I can make a note. Let's see if I can open a note. Hmm. Well, what am I doing wrong here? Just a second. Oh, why is not all of a sudden let me take do a note? Let me see if this this is not letting me take a note. What if it has anything to do with where I'm at? But you should be able to open some <clears throat> a library like that. And you should be able to add a note to any word. I don't know why it's not doing that. I'm I make let me see something here. Well, let me research it and I'll I'll get back with you on it. But Normally, you can choose a word, you can make a note, you can certainly make a note at any scripture. See, it's not letting me do that, right? Yeah, there it is. Well, wait. Oh, what didn't do that? I'll, I'll check that out and look at it, but you can generally put a note anywhere you want to put one. Like see right here, I've got one for damnation. I've got an explanation about it. And that's right in the middle. It's not letting me do it again, but I did do it. 
So I don't know if it may be because I'm that I'm sharing a screen or something. The sentence not working exactly right. Anyway, it's a, it's just a great Bible program that you can do a whole lot with. Uh, resurrections. Okay, so <clears throat> let me get back here. Um, he says, "Very, barely the hour." I'm in verse 25 here. Uh, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. They that hear shall live. I had already read that. It will happen. The same thing will happen in a restored church in the harvest in the Gentile world, where the remainder of the overcomers will be made up. Those two groups will make up the man child that will rule and reign Christ for a thousand years. That's that's basically the first resurrection. We can add here Revelations 20. Um, um, okay, so <clears throat> Jesus saw thrones, or John did. They that sat in them was given to them. A judgment was given unto them, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Then it said, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. <clears throat> On such second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and reign with him for a thousand years. So everyone in the first resurrection, those are those that overcome. See, it shows that they, they have thrones, they're ruling and reigning with Christ. And they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. It's not talking about getting your head cut off naturally. It's talking about losing your headship and Christ becoming your head. And for the word of God, and for and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image. See, this is a new group. The bride's not made up until the end of the Gentile world. It's not finished being made up until after the beast and his image is judged and dealt with. In the 19th chapter, they're both cast into the lake of fire, which is second death. Neither had received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This that he's talking about here is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead are not going to live again until after the thousand years. That's the resurrection of the unjust. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection on whom such second death have no power. But they'll be priests of God and of Christ and reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, so he goes on and shows here the great white throne and this final resurrection, those rest of the dead that lived not again to the thousand years. We could add that in here to, you know, just, and, and it is good information to add in. And of course, if I use this to talk and those brother nice questions, I will add that in. I just am hitting the meat of the, uh, or the crux of the matter first. Okay, then number two, the resurrection of the just. Those who were and are justified by faith. Their question was, is can you resurrect? Can you get in a resurrection without the Holy Ghost? Now, they know that people under the old covenant did, but they don't believe since the early church anyone can. But, uh, of course, I give this Isaiah 26, 19 and 20. Thy men, thy dead men shall live together with my dead body, shall they arise, awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust. Uh, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Also in Malachi 3, 16, 17, it says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. In a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Those who lived and are living a dedicated life of faith 
and all they knew and understand in serving the Lord, no matter what time they lived. These also include others who resurrected, who died also having been justified by faith during the time of Christ's ministry right on through today. I would say Lazarus was granted a just resurrection when Jesus resurrected him. John 11, 33, we said, Lazarus, come forth. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The thief on the cross would be one dimension who did not have the Holy Ghost, but was promised a resurrection today. Jesus said to him, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. That's talking about the day of the Lord, not that 24-hour day. Jesus went to the grave that day. He didn't name resurrect himself, but he was talking about while it was called today, the day of the Lord. In fact, I'm, I'm putting together some scriptures to show, I think it would be good to show scriptures pertaining to the day of the Lord, the day of his wrath, the day of vengeance, uh, the day of his judgment. Uh, I think if, if, you know, it'd be good to put all them scriptures together so that we can help show what, how those time frames work. Uh, there's a month, there's an hour, day, day of vengeance, day of judgment, day of wrath. Um, uh, the, the, let's see. Okay, so this was a time of from Pentecost AD 70, the harvest time period of the New Testament church. A person did not have to have have to be baptized in the Holy Ghost to be just. I did put here, I probably need to change this. However, as you mentioned, I just put however. There. However, a person must be born again of the new nature of God, the Holy Ghost, and grow in that nature to full maturity of perfection to inherit everlasting life. Once a person truly is converted by faith, let them in, uh, and maintains that commitment of faith, they are counted worthy and sins not imputed unto them while they are working on their salvation. This also includes those. This also includes those who got two also's in there, don't I? Who have the Holy Ghost nature. Um, they are both counted worthy by the blood sacrifice of Christ as long as they remain faithful. Read Romans 4. Here's Romans 4 and 8, but I want to I, I, I do want to go to Romans 4. I think it would be good for us to cover it because this the Romans 4 solidifies my point, I think. Paul said, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not of God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. See, Abraham was not righteous, but because of his faith. That is, he was righteous and all he knew to do, but he wasn't perfect. He wasn't truly, you know, righteous in every way. But God counted him righteous because he had faith, and, and God did not impute iniquity or sin to him because he was living for God and all that he knew how to live for God. Verse four, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that work, worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. I think that's a quote out of Psalms 95. 
verse 7 says, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Okay, see not, verse 3. He, I, in other words, I was comparing that up there where they're not covered by works. Blessed is the man to whom the whole, the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessing then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How then, how, how was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or uncircumcision? Uh, the the spiritual type of circumcision is the Holy Ghost baptism. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Abraham wasn't circumcised when he began to have faith and believe in God's promise and his covenant that God made with him. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them whom are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had <clears throat> being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. In other words, if you can get the grace of God by keeping the law, then you don't need, you didn't need, they didn't need faith. Because the law, work, the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there's no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be secured to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. We're in that covenant. If you you know, once you're saved, you're in the covenant that God made with Abraham. As it is written, I have been made, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom uh, he believed, even God who quickened the dead and calleth, calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was 90. How many women do y'all know that had a baby at 90 years old? He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus Christ, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and who was raised again for our justification. My point here is, is that you are justified by faith. Uh, in next verse, chapter five, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So, when you have faith, even before you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, let's take Cornelius's house for an example. God was blessing Cornelius, and God, God sent an angel to Cornelius so that they could go beyond just having faith and being a convert into Judaism. He sent 
an angel sent, uh, had Cornelius send men to get Peter to come talk to them about Jesus, and they received the Holy Ghost while he was talking. But even today, those of us who have received the Holy Ghost, we're not righteous. Is anybody here can say I'm 100% righteous? I know I'm righteous in a measure, but I can't say that I have finished my course and that I'm, I'm a true overcomer completely and I'm in the fullness of Christ. But Christ, that I have been counted righteous because of my faith because I'm living in faith for God and doing, I'm growing little by little, here little, there little, and God is counting me righteous because of the work Christ did on the cross. That his blood, which is the Holy Ghost, life of God, is covering me. God accepted his sacrifice and counting me righteous He's my mediator and your mediator, and God counts you and I righteous. As long as we maintain our faithfulness in God, I've explained that scripture in Revelations 19, where it says they that are with Christ. Well, you know, he's going to come riding on a white horse. Actually, it says this in the 17th chapter, but it's referring to Christ that's coming on a white horse, and they'll be on white horses too. Uh, which is righteousness. That, that's just righteous assemblies that's going to be in this uh, last prophetical hour, which is a war in heaven, just like it was in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelations. And the early church where Michael and his angels or Jesus and his ministry warred against the dragon power that was back there at Rome. And so that's going to happen again down here in the end of this world. And those that are going to be on white horses. Okay. It says they that were with him were the called chosen and faithful. I have a little message on that where I teach uh, how that when God begins to deal with you, Jesus said, no man cometh unto me except my father draws him. Somebody said at this meeting, said it was Brother Albert Adams. He said, God dragged you. <laughs> he drugged you in here. <coughs> That's true for some of us. Some of us, it didn't take much more than a tug, but I think some of us literally were drugging. Uh, but so God is calling. When you get here and God's dealing with you, God's calling you. And as long, until you answer that call, and you're just called. You're not chosen. The way you're chosen of God is when you say yes to the Lord with an unequivocal yes. Yes, Lord, I will give you my life. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. I mean, we don't even know what he's going to ask us to do, but he's got us in a contract condition when he breaks us down and can, uh, we're convicted of our sins and God begins to deal with us for salvation, to come to him and become a part of his nature, become a part of his family, become a part of his body. Um, and so once you say yes, it has to be a a unequivocal yes. It has to be yes, whatever, Lord. I submit to the holy, okay? Then you're chosen. God chooses you when you make that commitment. And that happens before you see the Holy Ghost in most cases. Uh, then normally you're, you're baptized in water. You don't finish the, the baptism of repentance until you're baptized in water. Uh, and then you go on and you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. You still have a process to go through. It's, it's all steps of the saving power of God. And, and then as long as you continue in that being chosen 
faithful in you being chosen, you are faithful. Now, once God says, uh, I want you to do this, and you say, oh, wait, I can't do that. Once you resist God on that, you just go back to being called. You, you, you're going to go all the way back and just be, I don't know how many of y'all ever played Mother May I, the little, the little game. Does everybody know what Mother May I is? The little game where you have to say, in America, I don't know how it is over in Canada, but in America, there was a little game, you know, little kids lined up and then there had to be somebody being the mother. And they'd say, they'd call your name and say, Mickey, take two steps forward. And if you said, mother, may I, they'd say, yes, you take two steps forward. Well, the game keeps going, but when you say, when they tell you to do it and you do it without saying, Mother, may I, you go back to the start of the line and start all over. So that's the little game. Uh, most everybody in America has played it jillions of times when there's little kids, Mother, may I. What's that way in God? When God asks you to do something and you, you, will not, you cannot come up with it and you resist God in it, you're going back to being called. You're no longer faithful. You're no longer you're no longer chosen. So you're chosen and faithful as long. And the, so the answer is yes. You know we got that little song. How's that song go? I'll say yes, Lord, yes to your will and to your way. You know, all know the song. That that. Uh, and anyway, that's how I explain being called, chosen, and faithful. It takes yes to remain a part of the chosen and faithful. Uh, okay, so this, we're imputed, righteousness is imputed to us. We're justified by faith. God is covering us. we got a mediator, we got a high priest that's standing between us and God, and God accepts and imputes righteousness. He does not impute sin. He doesn't hold sin against us because we're, we're faithful and he knows we're going to repent. If we come knowledge of it, we're going to repent of it. We're going to begin to work on that. So, uh, so the, in this resurrection of the just, what it requires to get in that resurrection is faith, being justified by faith. It doesn't matter if you're the thief on the cross. It doesn't matter if you're Lazarus when he got sick and died under the law. It doesn't matter all those under the law. It doesn't matter if those that are in that have died in the dark ages and they were living for God and all they knew to live for God, they're in the book of remembrance and they're just. Now, I want to explain this, that our teachings in the past for years were that the resurrection of the just and the unjust was this final resurrection in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelations. That every, no, there is no other resurrection is the way we taught it. Um, I can tell you that <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I was pastoring in Midland, Texas, Actually, I believe I was in Winters, Texas, when I first began to hear about this resurrection of the just down here in a restored church. That, that, that teaching was taught by Revy Mears, Cornelius and Mears' father. Brother Victor Brown studied that. Brother Victor Brown studied that. He talked to Revy Mears about it. Revy Mears told him, he said, you've got the truth, it's right, but this brotherhood will not accept that right now. They just won't. Um, but I know I remember a time when I was in Midland that Brother Leninger was really um, working on that uh, doctrine, on that teaching, and Revy Mears was looking at it. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not Revy, but Cornelius Mears was looking at it. But he did not, after he looked at it, he did not continue in it. He went back to our original teaching on it. 
So I'm telling you, there's several brethren in the body, way more than not of those that believe that the that there is no resurrection in the end of the Gentile world in the restored church. I'm going to give you scriptures on that in a minute. I, I can't, the brethren know, I've, I've taught this in meetings, ministers' meetings. They've worked me over about it. They worked Brother Leniger over about it. Uh, I really, to be honest with you, I didn't get this from Brother Leniger to start with. I got it from what I heard about Revy Mears, Brother Victor Brown, Brother, um, and what Brother Leniger was doing. And, and when brother when I heard Brother Leniger was working on it, then I began to confer with Brother Leniger and talk to him about it. Um, I know a lot of people think that I got this from Brother Leniger, but it's really not true. That's not where it started in me. But I have to admit, Brother Leniger helped me a bunch with it. And uh, because God really helped him with it. Uh, okay, so let me go back over here. Um, I said, read Romans chapter four, and we did. And I just put Romans, I didn't want to put the whole book in here. Blessed is man in whom the Lord not impute sin. Blessed is that man, uh, not impute sin, it says. They can lose that by turning from their faithfulness and become unjust and would then be up in the resurrection, then would come up in the resurrection of the unjust. Now let's go to John 5, 28. Um, let's just, whoops, let me take this out, whoops. Let me get out of that again. Okay. So he just got through saying up here, the hour is coming. This is talking about those that are going to be in the first resurrection. But he goes on down. He says, let's read it. For the father hath life in himself. So I have to give him the son to have life in himself. And I have given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life. That is the resurrection of the just. Okay. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That is the resurrection of the unjust. Okay. Let's go over here. I just got through reading this. Uh, the it's the resurrection of the unjust. See Acts 24, 15. Here's where Paul is standing before Felix, and he says, I have, I have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. So he's referring to here is these same things that Jesus was referring to in Matthew 28 uh, and 29. These people are going to come out of the graves. This is a graveyard resurrection. That first resurrection is not a graveyard resurrection. That's a resurrection unto life from the death of the flesh that, that we're, we're under the curse of death, and God resurrects us from that. If we live in a time when there is overcoming, I've gave this scripture before, I'll go to it right quick in Isaiah chapter 40. Um, okay, verse 12 here. <clears throat> Well, let me let me back up to verse 10. It says, Behold, the Lord will come with strong hand. That is the coming of the Lord, which is in the end of the Jewish world, and it's also in the end of the Gentile world, in the restored church as well as the early church, was which was a divine order of God. He'll come with strong hand or a strong ministry, and his arm, that's Christ, shall rule for him. The, the arm of God, the picture there is, is Christ reached into the earth, and he has a hand on the end of that arm, and that's what rule, 
That's, that was a strong hand or ministry. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And he'll feed his flock like a shepherd and gather the lambs with his arm and carry them into his bosom, into his covenant. They shall gently lead those that are with young. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Jesus has measured the waters as the world. He's, he's judged or measured it out in, with a ministry in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with a span. A span is three palm widths. Three times you lay your hand down like this. You take that palm width. You take another one and another one, and that would be a span. Well, that's talking about how he meted out heaven with a span. He did it in the early church. That was one span with one span of his ministry. Again, down here in the restored church, he'll meet out heaven or the bride down here, the overcomers. Then during the thousand years, he'll meet out another span with a ministry down through the thousand years. He will meet out heaven with a span and comprehend the dust of the earth in a measure and weigh the mountains, that's religious elements, in scales and hills also of religion in a balance. Uh, so God, that's how he's, that's how he's bringing about his, his purpose, his overall purpose. Um, so Paul had a hope for a resurrection of the just and the unjust. I'll, I'll explain to you in, in a minute why I do not put those resurrections both in the end of the thousand years, because I don't think there's anybody that's mentioned that is just in that final resurrection. And then there's other resurrections the Bible talks about that some men just don't see it, or they can't. It's hard for people to change, I'm telling you. So let's go back over here into writing the resurrection of the unjust now. Any of God's children not living faithful in a dedicated life, if they're in the body of Christ, Babylon, or backslid in the world. These will make up the unjust group of God's children from the beginning through the Jewish world and the Gentile worlds. These are all those who will come up in the final resurrection after the 1,000 year millennial reign. Revelations 20 and 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. This, this was, let, let's, let's go back to this verse. Okay, let's back up here. We're John in verse 11 says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whom the face of the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no, no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. I, I've, I've mentioned this many times. The books were open. That, that word books, it means scrolls. It means records. God has a record of everyone's life. And God, when God, when God brings you into a, a judgment, when he brings you before the judgment seat of Christ, God's going to open your record. He's going to begin to deal with you. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. That's the word of God. And the dead were judged out of those things, which were written in the books according to their works. God's going to judge every man according to every deed that he's ever committed. Um. It, you know, in other words, maybe you've got certain things forgiven, but God, let me, let me say this, even though God forgives your sins when you repent of your sins, that doesn't get rid of the source of your sin or why you sin. 
The Bible even says he cast your sins in the sea of forgetfulness. That is, God does not, re when you repent of sins, God does not bring those sins up against you in judgment to judge you for the wrong you've done. But he hasn't forgot what caused you to do that. And that's what God's got to get out of you. You got to overcome that Adamic nature, the flesh that you did that. I said at the meeting, I said, there's four things that you have got to overcome. There's four things that you've got to respond to God in, in this life. Number one is, uh, I label it as ser serpent. That's an individual spirit. That, that has to do with your personal response to God and how God's dealing with you. God, there was no other influence dealing with, with, with Adam and Eve. It was just they were having to respond to what God gave them commandments towards. And so that was their individual response. You got an individual response and in deal, in God dealing with you as an individual. But then when you look in the Old Testament, the word Satan comes up, which means adversary. And the word Satan is a group spirit. That's not an individual spirit. It always escalates into a group. And it's a religious spirit. You read the Old Testament, you'll see that all of those people that were an adversary against God's people, they had their own beliefs and their own way, you know, even, I mean, you could say it started out with, with uh, Cain. It was a religious spirit that he had, and he was developing that he could offer a different sacrifice than what God required. But that escalated in the Old Testament, and it became a group spirit or a religious spirit. You have to respond to how religion influences you, whether it's false religion, ideology, the truth, or whatever. You have got to respond. You got to be able to identify if it's false religion, if it's leaven, if it's if if it's the beast system, if it's the mark of the beast. You've got to respond to all of that. You've got to have an, a, a mind of, of that God has revealed the truth to. You. And then I use the scripture in the New Testament where was it Peter that said, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Uh, or he goeth about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Well, study roaring lion in, in the Bible. A roaring lion is evil leaders, evil rulers. That's what a roaring lion is. So <clears throat> the world, I'm using the devil there as the world, the influence of worldliness, civil power. Uh, well, when it became a dragon power, the civil and religious power conjoined or married, but that's the next element. But this category of the devil, just the worldly influence, worldly music, you know, worldly fads, uh, world, worldly ideology. I read the other day where someone said, if America turned to God and the Christian life, would it get us out of the problems that we're in? The first answer was from a man that said, France and Finland have no problem without God, without serving a God, and neither do we need one. It told me right away, this guy knows nothing about God. He knows nothing about, you know, uh, an ungodly nation or a godly nation. But anyway, uh, we have to respond to uh, the world, the, the influence that's in the world that's not in religion. See, there is an influence of, of worldly psychology, worldly ideology. Uh, worldly education uh, that excludes God. There's a lot of that worldly influence out here. Rather, it, it don't just 
it doesn't, it's not just something as simple as standards or just music, but it's everything that's outside of the kingdom of heaven that's in man. You, that has an influence on us. It has a great influence on our children. Uh, and then the fourth one is the dragon. You, and, and that's when I've said this many times that the highest influence of Satan or religion is whoever the people make their religious ruler worldwide. And then the highest influence of the devil outside of God's kingdom is the civil power. And that's whoever the people make their worldly ruler of civil, civil power. So when civil the civil power realizes I got to have the religious power to have control over the world and it marries or conjoins with Religious power, that becomes a dragon. Civil and, and religious power. The beast and civil power, that's a dragon. We have to, we've never responded to that. None of us has had to deal with that yet. But whoever lives in the last prophetical hour down here in the end of the Gentile world and the restored church will have to drill with, they'll have to deal with the dragon power. And it's going to, it's going to, it's going to mean persecution. Uh, okay, so, all right, so here, verse 13, the sea gave up the dead which were in it. The sea is, uh, that's the, that's those that are out in the world. That's God's children that are in the world. How'd they get there? Well, there's several ways that people wound up out in the world and they're no longer serving God. That they, these are not in religion. They're not in Babylon. They're not in the body, but they're in the world, living an ungodly sinner's life. They're God's children, and God is going to resurrect them. They're unjust, but the reason they're out there is they never lived in one of those three spans. They never lived during the early reign church, the restored church down here, or the millennial reign. They died in that condition in the world, in the sea. They're God's children. Some of them literally starved to death. They were in Babylon. They didn't have enough truth. They could not maintain their spirituality because it just wasn't enough to sustain their faith. Some people are victims. There is collateral damage in all religion, including the body of Christ. There's people that's been hurt by men that were unwise. Um, and God's going to, God remembers them. Uh, they'll have an opportunity. God's going to resurrect them so that they'll have an opportunity to see the, hear the truth and see a full sevenfold light manifestation of God in the end of the world. Brother Linegar, he liked to call that, a, he called, what do you call that? Supreme Court. He'd say, God's children are all will stand before a supreme court. They, he meant that being the judgment seat of Christ, that you're not going to have to be judged by an improper judgment, but you're going to get before a supreme court, before God will eternally judge you. I remember the first time Brother Leninger mentioned in Portland, Oregon, he said all of God's children from the least way back under the law in the beginning until now, every one of them will come up in a resurrection. Man, the, the, the ministry jumped on him like ugly on a stick, you know, because they thought God judged them. If God judged them, they're judged. Well, God judged them, you know, in that day, that don't mean they're eternally judged. But God's children that are in the world, rather they just turned and said, I'm sick of this. Whatever reason, they backslid and went out into the world. They're God's children. They've been born of God. If they're, if they're God's children, they're going to resurrect in the resurrection of the unjust. That's the sea gave up the dead that was in it. And then death and hell delivered up the dead that were in them. 
Well, if you remember, the white rider of the white horse is death. The rider was death, and hell followed with it. Well, that, that's where, in other words, you could be in a religious system. There's two or three ways of looking at this. One way, I'll, I'll, probably the simplest is explain it this way. If death is reigning in your life and you're not living a life of faith, there's people, there's people in Babylon, there's people in the body of Christ. They're not saved. They're not living a dedicated life. They know it. Everybody in the church knows it as well as the pastor. There's people in our churches that just, they're not dedicated. They're not faithful. They don't work in order. They're not just. They're not living a dedicated life but they haven't turned and went into the world either. So death is reigning in their life. And then hell is a religious, that hell is, I mean, ultimately it takes you to the grave, but it's, it's a religious system that you get caught up in that you may die in that system. And God's going to, if you're God's child, even though you may die in that, you're, God's going to resurrect you and give you an opportunity to hear the truth and overcome sin and live. All three of these, the sea, death, and hell, I don't see anybody in this that is just. To me, these people are all unjust. And they're, you know, in other words, they've been deceived. They but they haven't, I, I'm sure God's dealt with them several times in, in, in the deception to, to search it out, to, to reconsider, you know. So God's going to give them an opportunity to hear the truth. Um, okay, again, these are they in, in John 5, 29b. Let's go back over there. 29b says, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That word damnation means judgment. It's, it's translated in the Bible 48 times, the Greek word, 41 times as judgment, three times as damnation, two times is two as a accusation, and two times as condemnation. So there they they already are under damnation of judgment because of they're not living a dedicated life and they're going to resurrect unto a judgment um and that judgment is a punishing judgment it's not like it's not like the judgment of the just that are living for god faithfully and god is leading them with information you know, correction, chastisement, but it's it's tender. But this this judgment down here, it this is gonna be a rod of iron that God's gonna deal with these people because they've lived an unjust life and they're they haven't lived faithfully. They're God's children, and God is not going to judge them eternally. Um uh, okay, so in recap. I think I don't think I need to recap. I, I've got it wrote down here, and I'll post it because I'm just basically going over it in synoptic form. Uh, but I'm, I do want to go to First Thessalonians four, and I don't know the saints here has heard me talk on this quite a bit, but I still believe that uh, I think it's I still believe it's important enough that it be rehearsed in your ears that you get it. First, what I want you to know is, is the Apostle Paul was in Thessalonica for three Sabbath days. That He's writing here. This is in 1 Thessalonians 4. He was there for three Sabbaths. In other words, he goes to this new, new area. He goes into a man's house by the name of Jason, and, 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 he, and they're having services there. He, Jason lets him have services in his home. And he's only there three weekends. And the Jews found out he were there, and they, run, they came to run him out of town. 
Well, the group heard that he, they were coming to run him out of town, so they sent Paul out. They sent him away. So he escaped, and he went to a town called Berea. And um, so um, when he went to Berea, it says that they that in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they searched the scriptures daily to see if what things he was teaching was so. So he noticed that there was something more noble about these people, even than these in Thessalonica. He sends Timothy back to Thessalonica, and, and uh, Timothy later comes to him and gives him a report, and uh, evidently br brings questions to him and a report about him. So here he writes his first letter to him. He said, I, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That word, sleep here refers to death and the grave, not death to sin. To be put to sleep, to slumber. It does show figuratively to, to decease, sleep, or be dead. Remember he told uh, concerning, you know, they didn't understand that Lazarus was dead, his disciple. He finally said, he sleepeth. But finally, he said, Lazarus is dead. He finally made it plain to him. But he's telling them, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them that are asleep or dead that have died, that you saw not even as others which have no hope. In other words, he's saying, look, and, and no, no doubt their question was, this is a baby church, brand new. He was only there three weekends. And they're no doubt they're probably saying, what if we don't overcome sin and we die? And his answer is, is I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those that have died and that you, I don't want you to sorrow for them like you would sorrow for people that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So he's saying, here, here, here's why I don't you to, to sorrow. Because if you believe Jesus died and resurrected, even so them also which sleep in Jesus or have died, will God bring with him? How? In a resurrection. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That word prevent, it means to be beforehand. In other words, we're not going to go before them. We're not going to stop them just because they're in the grave. We're not going to prevent them from being a part of this group. God will bring him with him in a resurrection. For if the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, to me, that's the, that's the seventh trumpet. This is when God is going to resurrect those that are just. This is the resurrection of the just in the end of the in the end of the Gentile world, just like there was a resurrection in Matthew 27, 52. I haven't read you that scripture yet. Uh, I know all of you know it. it says it right here. And the graves after Jesus died, it said the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints. Um, and if you look at that word many, it means multitude of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and were appeared and appeared to many. These people are those Old Testament worthies that resurrected. Uh, but let me go on here and let's get back to 1 Thessalonians. Those that are alive and remain into the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Now that right there, I feel certain Paul is dealing with the fact they'd be caught up with them in a restored church to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. In other words, he just covered it. The reason for this just resurrection is so that you can be caught up in overcoming life and be forever with the Lord, with the rest of those that are going to make the bride. That's the reason for the resurrection of the just. Now, now I want to explain to you how we used to teach this. Now, many men still do. They teach. Let's go back to verse 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brother, concerning them which are asleep that you saw not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even though also them also which sleep in Jesus, and we they teach and we did teach that they are dead in Christ in an overcoming life. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain of the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, that we taught, that's overcomers. They'll rise first, and we'll be caught up together with them. That's how we taught that. When I learned that Paul's talking to a church, that he was there for three weeks, do you believe any of these people overcame in three weeks? They, they didn't even understand the doctrine of resurrection. That's why he's, having, why he's having to explain it to them. And when he tells them, I don't want you to sorrow for them like you'd sorrow for people that don't have any hope. Uh, to me, it's ludicrous to try to make this group of people overcomers. I think it makes much more sense than the way that we're explaining it now. Um, so then, right quick, I'll, I'm going to go to Hebrews 12, and uh, go to this scripture. Uh, he, in, in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, he's showing all these people what they suffered, and that they would not turn against God, because they had hope of a better resurrection. Uh, How did he, let's see where he says that. Oh, I may be, is that in the end of the 11th chapter? Yes. Uh, here he's talking about all these people right here, women there re, that received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting the deliverance, that they might obtain a better, better resurrection. He ends this chapter by saying, all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. All of these faithful people from righteous Abel on down, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. This, this group is that group in Isaiah 26 that together with my dead body shall they arise. It's also this same group that I read to you in 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, those in Malachi 3 that often spake of God. God heard it. He hearkened to it. He wrote, um, uh, he put their names in a book of remembrance and said, they shall be mine in the day that I make up my jewels. That's his bride. He's talking about the early church. It's talking about all these people of the Old Testament worthies. Okay, so here, this goes right along with that, saying that these, without us of the early church, those that resurrected when Christ, after Christ's resurrection could not be made perfect without them, without what we got in the new covenant, the baptism of the Holy Ghost and overcoming the, the Adamic nature. Um. Now, we'll finish right here in Revelations 11. Uh, let's write down the 18th 
18 verse. So he starts off here showing this is a restored church. Um, yeah, they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. That's the restored church in the, the same hour, the last prophetical hour. There was a great shaking. That was the second woe. And then the seventh angel sounded. That's the seventh trumpet. That's the last trumpet. That's the same trump of God that sounds in 1 Thessalonians 4. And he said, and the nations were angry, verse 18, and thy wrath is come. The nations are going to be angry because, just like I told you, there's going to be a dragon power. And when we rise up against that dragon power in a restored church, it's going to, it's going to just going to make them mad, just like it made Nero in Rome and the Judaizers mad. The dragon system is going to fight against that and try to snuff it out. But it ain't gonna, they ain't gonna win. So the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that they should, thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them that destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. So it's been closed until now. You couldn't get into eternal life in the end of the Gentile world until the last prophetical hour. And there was seen in the temple, the ark of his testimony, there was lightnings, voices, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. There's judgment. But God is going to reward his servants, the prophets and the saints, and them that fear thy name, both small and great. It's the time of the dead. This is a resurrection of the just and the end of the Gentile world. This goes along with 1 Thessalonians 4, that resurrection that he's coming in the end of that world when he comes. So I just thought that I would try to give an explanation through this, you know, kind of through all three resurrections, the first resurrection, resurrection of the just, and the resurrection of the unjust. Um, There could be more said about it, but uh, I think I think that it's it's pretty well covered, and I hope it's covered in a. I hope that I've been able to convey it in a way that's understandable to you, that it makes sense to you what I'm saying, uh, and that you understand the scriptures that I'm given. Again, I will uh, I will take these these. Um, notes that I have, and I will post them uh, with the recording um, on our on our fate on our WhatsApp group page. So you'll have all these notes with the scriptures. You won't be able to click on it and be able to go to the scripture like I'm doing, but you just have to you can copy if you want to copy all that and put it in an olive tree Bible note, it'll work but it won't work outside of Bible tree, my uh, olive tree. Anyway, I'll do that. God bless all your hearts. We did not have service Wednesday night because I had, I come home with COVID, me and Sister Smith. The painters were exposed. They, they didn't have anything serious either, but anyway, we had it. And uh, so I, we appreciate all your prayers. I do want to announce, I saw Brother Durham did post we are having a, a work day tomorrow, uh, Saturday morning at eight o'clock. I think we've got enough tile to finish putting up all the tile, the ladies restroom, men's restroom in the hallways that weren't finished. I think we can get that done. We may even be able to get some more things done. Always there's work there that sisters can do. And uh, so any of you sisters that can come, we appreciate it. And uh, all you folks up north, pray for us that we get the job done. <laughs> All right. God bless your hearts. Let's remember Brother Goss, the work in Keswick, the church, the people there, the Goss family. Remember 
uh, they did cancel the minister's meeting in the Hearst next month because of so many people having COVID. That was changed to two. It's a minister's meeting at Brother Bragg's in Hearst to October the 19th, 20th, 21st. Starts at 10:30 that morning. So we'll have, you know, we'll we'll have more formal uh, notices of that. I know, but uh, keep praying for Bill Daniels. Uh, we got three of our sisters in Alaska. I have no idea what they're doing up there, but they are up there. Anyway, they're having a good time, I think. Last I heard, they having a blast. Can you imagine Sister Tally and Sister Holly Loriano? I mean, Sister Bonnie's just bound to be along for the ride because it's going to be a ride for sure with them, those two girls. Anyway, they're having fun. They called us today. I don't know. They just wanted to try to uh, FaceTime something to us, but they never did get it done. Anyway, pray for the trip, though, that they have a safe trip back home. Um, Sister, Sister uh, Crafton, let's keep her in our prayers. She's doing better from what I understand. She's doing good. So let's keep praying for her. Uh, Brother Gary Wright in Humble, Texas. Uh, I know he, he had a treatment last week, but he's been just in and out of the hospital, very unstable and still certainly needs our prayers. They have another treatment that they're hoping will help help him. He's got an incurable cancer of the bone marrow, but it can be controlled by treatments. And uh, But it, this treatment he's been on has quit working. So they're trying to get him on another treatment. And that's why he's been in such bad shape because they haven't been able to keep up his blood. They've had to give him several units of blood just to keep him going. So pray for Brother Wright. Um, Got a lady in Igwe in the Dominican Republic that has cancer, breast cancer. She certainly needs our prayers. Um, she started treatments, but they think they caught it early enough. So hopefully they have. All right, let me stop our, let me stop sharing here. And then uh, let's all turn our microphones on and pray together. Brother Roy Durham's sister has got cancer, I believe, isn't that right, Brother Durham? Yeah. And she's had many complications with different things. Yeah, she she's doing good. She she was transferred from a hospital to a skilled nursing facility, so she's actually doing better thanks to all good. the prayers. All right, so let's keep praying for her. What's her name, Brother Durham? Betty. Betty. All right, so let's remember that. Anyone else have a request you want to mention before we pray together? Pray for Brother Sister Fisher's little girl, Mallory. She's just a little sweetheart, but I think she's done pretty good, isn't she, Brother Fisher? Yes, sir. We're thankful for that. God seems to be helping in that situation. Yes, God. Just lift up, right. this, yes. lift up this weekend uh, in our assembly. Brother Paul Abelard from Montreal and this wife and a couple of children are coming to visit tomorrow they're coming good so right. lift up the weekend with that all right let's remember that praise god thank you lord Jesus. hallelujah hallelujah bless your holy name hallelujah. Hallelujah. oh god you are so faithful hallelujah Oh God, touch our eyes and touch our ears, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Praise God. Oh, God. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, 